You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. For all the talk of this wildfire season being the worst in Canada's history, there is one town in a fire-prone area for which that simply won't be true. Because there is no town to burn anymore. I've ordered the town evacuated, and I've told everyone as I was leaving town to leave. It took like a whole 15 minutes from, you know, the first sign of smoke to all of a sudden there being fire, you know, everywhere. That was the mayor of Lytton, B.C., in the hours after a fire all but wiped the town off the map in 2021. In the weeks and months to come, the town, as well as the province, pledged that this would not be the end of Lytton, that the community would rebuild and come back stronger. Two years later, that work has barely begun. Does that represent a failure or just reality? It's hard to say. After all, how do you rebuild an entire town and community from scratch when the resources that you would usually use to rebuild homes or businesses were also destroyed. Should the town, which holds the record for being the hottest place in Canada, as well as a location in an area vulnerable to these types of fires, be rebuilt on the same spot? Is that wise? What happened to Lytton, BC, and its people when the media moved on to other fires and new climate disasters? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Tyler Olson is an editor and reporter at the Fraser Valley Current. Hello, Tyler. Hi, thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for finding time for us. I wanted to start maybe by just asking you to uh, take us to Lytton, B.C. Where is it? What was it like? So Lytton is a couple hundred kilometers from north east of Vancouver. It's up the Fraser Canyon and at the confluence of BC's two two of BC's largest rivers, the Fraser River and the Thompson River. Its location is really important both both historically and for for the events that happened in 2021. If you're familiar with BC, you are familiar with the Fraser Canyon. It's the point where the the wet coastal climate of the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island essentially transitions to a much drier, hotter interior climate. We know that it was a key trading route. There are key fishing grounds in the area. And so the village site and the surrounding area was has been inhabited for thousands of years. Hmm. Canadian Pacific Railway and the Canadian National Railway, CN Rail and CP Rail, both run through the Fraser Canyon and through Lytton. Its position on the Fraser River makes it pretty much the key transportation route between the BC interior and the BC coast. And it's been that way for hundreds and probably thousands of years. Because of that, when British Columbia was settled, Lytton was a key stopping point during the gold rush. Hmm. So in 1858, when the, the BC gold rush started, just north of Lytton really, Conflict between the indigenous people in the Lytton area and the American miners boiled up into a short but bloody conflict that's known as the Fraser Canyon War. Hmm. And throughout the next century, we saw the entire development of British Columbia funneled in a way through that Fraser Canyon. People used the railways to get across the country, not just across BC, but across the country. Right. The Trans-Canada Highway was built through there. And so Lytton is a tiny place in a, in a, in a canyon that is a very steep canyon and not great for building or building a large place, but it was a very important place. And so it became a hub and a center for a, for a community and a very diverse community too. You had a, a Chinese history museum there. There were a Buddhist monastery in in the hills just above it. It was an integrated community between First Nation communities. There was large, uh, a significant First Nation population, and there still is. And then there was the town site itself, which provided services to a region of a couple thousand people, and then 
as well as the couple hundred people who lived in the the town site itself. It's an incredible history that I admittedly, as somebody from Ontario, had no idea about until reading some of your work and especially a really detailed feature uh, you've written on the town itself. I think most of Canada, myself included, obviously, knows Lytton, B.C. for one thing. You alluded to it a little bit. What happened in 2021? This is why we're using past tense and present tense and shuffling between them, I guess. The fire in 2021 destroyed the entire village site aside from two or three buildings. And uh, as I've mentioned, the village site itself was not huge, but a couple hundred people lived there and it provided services for a huge, very rural but but significant region. So that fire that ripped through there, people can remember the images. They know it. Maybe they've heard of it. It's it's hard to kind of sum up, though, the significance of it, because we've had fires that go through towns before, unfortunately. Right. But what's different about this one? Right. And, and what's different about this one is that this fire didn't just go through a portion of town or it didn't just go um, into a, a large neighborhood and, and, and devastate that area. It knocked out an entire village and it went mm-hmm. through the village core and ripped its guts out, essentially. You had banks there. You had the grocery stores it destroyed. Right. You had the fire department it destroyed and the police department it destroyed. It destroyed the village hall and it destroyed the place where the village stored their backup records. It's so every little piece, nearly every little piece of infrastructure in the village itself was destroyed. And because of that, the fire's effects have had a long and lasting and very damaging impact both on on the village which was which it was always going to have but on its ability and the government's ability to rebuild it in the days after the fire and i remember that fire as i mentioned um the way you described it there are photos of just you know nothing there where a town used to be and it's it's different from so many fire images we see where you know it's touched a few houses and hasn't touched others in the days after uh, the disaster, what did the government say about rebuilding? What kind of plans were made for this community? I have to admit, from out here, I assumed that it would never be rebuilt. That's not what was supposed to happen. No, and in, in the days after, there was talk about rebuilding it for a new century, for a new time when there's increased likelihood and risk of natural disasters. There's good reason why you would want to and need to rebuild Lytton. It's in a remote area. And now that there's a new highway that runs called the Coquihalla that runs between the coast and the interior, it's now more or less off the beaten track. But it still provided um, services for a large number of people. And if you value and think that it's important to not rip those services away from those people, you need to show an effort in rebuilding. The scale and the size of the Indigenous communities in the area, too, have grown up just as the other people in the area have built around these services that were provided in the village of Lytton. So Mm -hmm. rebuilding the village of Lytton would serve notice that we can rebuild and we can live in these communities even as climate change and other man-made forces make them more likely. In the weeks after the fire... Before we get to the rebuilding efforts, what happened to the people of Lytton and of the surrounding community? And I guess this is key. How was their experience different from, uh, say, the the victims of the floods or other fires that we typically talk about as disasters? And, and unfortunately, your area has seen a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so immediately after the fire, residents fled north to Lillooet. They fled to the east to Kamloops and they fled to the south to the Fraser Valley and the communities of Chilliwack and Abbotsford. And there they stayed in emergency accommodations for, I I would like to say a couple months, but frankly, some people were there for more than a year in, in, in the various places. The challenges were aggravated in part because Lytton was the first fire of that 2021 fire season or the first, the first notable severely damaging fire, but it was not the last one. There was the White Rock Lake fire. 
that burn large numbers of, of homes in the Okanagan. Mm-hmm. By the time the summer ended, you had people in, say, the Fraser Valley who were evacuated from Lytton join sometimes in hotels and other places by evacuees from other fires. Right. Now, the the recovery from those other fires has been quicker because you've had the local supports needed to create the the framework needed to rebuild communities and rebuild neighborhoods. In Lytton, that all went away when the when the village was burned. British Columbia's system for rebuilding communities really stresses the local voice and putting the rebuilding efforts in the hands of the local communities and local municipalities. And in Lytton, none of that existed. And it really still maybe hasn't been fully appreciated, the the damage that that caused, the infrastructure and the human infrastructure that was required and was available in other communities and has been available in past fires, just was no longer there in Lytton because you had a community where even the mayor and the councillors had lost their homes. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine being a councillor or a mayor elected to a to run a very small village and then lose your home and then have it be your job to rebuild not just your home, but your entire community. Right. And to have to do something that essentially hasn't been done before in British Columbia was just potentially and probably impossible for any any people in that position. So after two years then, uh, or almost two years, how has the rebuild been going? I understand all the challenges that you've just outlined. And in fact, it's almost like it has never been done before. What has happened? What's on the ground there now? I drove through Lytton, I think, first when they opened it up a couple months after the fire. And at that point, there were burned out shells of buildings everywhere. There were burned out wreckages of cars. There was fire debris everywhere. And there was just two or three buildings standing. And what has changed since then is that the debris has gone, the burned out wreckage has gone, and the cars have gone. But only in the last couple of months have you seen even modular buildings being erected. And we're talking two or three of them. It's essentially, and, and as the mayor told me, a wasteland. And this was something that she told me in February of 2023. And so as the months have passed, a couple more modular buildings have sprung up. But essentially the last two years has been spent cleaning up the sites, removing and testing the soil for contaminants, testing the ground for archaeological items of significance, and and waiting. There's been a lot of waiting Mm -hmm. on the parts of those who would like to see faster progress. Why is it taking so long? Doesn't the British Columbia government have like a blueprint specifically for rebuilding after disasters? I understand the scope of this is larger, but we're still replacing homes and buildings. The BC government has a blueprint for helping communities rebuild themselves, essentially, is the issue. Hmm. And that blueprint doesn't apply in Lytton because the village itself doesn't hasn't had the capacity. It's lost staff, and the people who have come in to replace those staff members have themselves had to leave. And when we're talking about staff, we're talking about staff in the in the single digits often because right. this is again a community of a couple hundred people. It doesn't have a huge budget. They've brought in people and consultants from outside, and thankfully, remote work has allowed people to not have to live on the ground to help out. But the stresses and the challenges have made the human resources part of it immensely difficult. You've had the changing way in which communities process or interact with areas of historical significance has also really changed over the past mm, decade, even, right? is what I've heard. A decade or two decades ago, you would have seen maybe the soil quickly tested and buildings start to go up right away. Hmm. But because it was known there had been communities living on the site for thousands of years, it was known right away that there could be when all of this dirt and contaminated debris was pulled out of the soil, pieces of lives, lives that were lived hundreds or thousands of years ago, these right. archaeological fragments of life. 
And so they budgeted it at the time, I think $1 million to, to check the soil for these pieces and where possible to go through the permitting process, which is quite created by the pro- province and quite rigorous. Yeah. What they found were 95 different pieces because this was a place that had been lived on for thousands of years. And so that process itself, which people didn't at the time maybe fully realize, or at least the government didn't fully realize, would be as extensive as it has, has has slowed the process, as has the removal of contaminants, and really has has a lack of urgency and, and understanding, I think, on the parts of the people with the purse strings and the people who maybe aren't as connected to this process. This is dragging and and there are just little little things that add up over time and and each complicate one another and have resulted in in this being such a drawn up process. While this is going on, um, what are the residents of the town doing? You mentioned some of them spent almost a year uh, in emergency housing. Where are they now? Are they waiting for their town to be rebuilt? Are they just going elsewhere? So some of the residents spent more than a year and Man. and. Many people have moved on. Some people have taken their insurance proceeds and attempted to rebuild their lives elsewhere. Some, sadly, have passed away in the time that the rebuilding process hasn't progressed. Mm -hmm. So the people of Lytton have expressed frustration with the fact that at the start of this process, we heard government talking about wanting to rebuild Lytton as a model community to be energy efficient and resilient in the face of climate change. And while they didn't object to that, and they haven't objected specifically to that on on mass, what has been evident is that the their need for a level of urgency and speed to return them to their homes hasn't, or wasn't at least until fairly recently maybe, communicated or at least seem to be a priority on the parts of government and those in charge of of laying the framework for the rebuilding of Lytton. There was an election in the fall of 2021, and a new council and mayor were elected who stressed the need to rebuild and, and speed the rebuilding process up as, up as much as possible. But even those people have found it challenging and will find it challenging because many of the challenges and problems that have delayed the rebuilding of Lytton still exist. They still need government to deliver funding when it's promised. They still need the people themselves to see value and see a future in this community that has now been gone for two years, but had such a vibrant and lively sense about it and which could still have one. I think Lytton, as we've said, has a has a long history and there's no reason that it can't prosper in the 21st century and that it can't be a place along at the confluence of those two rivers that remains a junction and a place where people learn about the past and the people see the amazing beauty of the area. Last question. What could be done to make this go faster? Now that the government has seen that this is a town without the resources to rebuild itself, how can it step in and do more? Absent having a designated person who's in charge of cutting all the red tape that has held up the the rebuilding, there may not be a ton that the province can do at this point. But what the province can do is it can look at what's gone on here and consider whether any of the processes have been changed Mm -hmm. if a fire happens later this year and does something terrible to another small isolated community in this province. And what other places in Canada can can do is the same, is to look at their processes and figure out if those processes will work, not just for fires that damage a neighbourhood or eat around the fringe of a community, But if a fire or another natural disaster removes the entire infrastructure and the entire capacity of that community Mm -hmm. or those communities to function, we can look around our regions and our provinces and 
see communities that are highly at risk of natural disasters and and increasingly at risk of events because of climate change. And we can wonder what will happen and are our processes and does our government have the capacity to take those places that aren't going to be able to rebuild themselves and really help them to to the degree that they'll need Mm -hmm. if and when something does happen. We also have to, I think, remember that these aren't just small town questions. These are questions about um, what we do in, in the case of an earthquake, major ice storm. People have asked, why would you rebuild Lytton? It's in a place that could be susceptible to a future wildfire. But you have most people in BC live in places that are highly susceptible to a variety of natural events. Right. You have the threat of earthquakes, you have the threat of tsunamis, you have the threat of wildfires and floods. And and these aren't unique to Lytton. And so answering these questions is important, not just for the people of Lytton, but for the people of all of British Columbia and probably all of Canada. Tyler, thanks so much for this. And thanks for the work you're doing out there. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Tyler Olson, editor and reporter at the Fraser Valley Current. That was the big story for more, including our initial reporting from Lytton in 2021. You can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always talk to us if you want to by following us on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn, by emailing us using hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, or by picking up the phone and dialing 416-935-5935 and leaving a message after the beep. It's been years since I used that phrase. You can find The Big Story in every podcast player, and as you should know by now, you can ask for it on a smart speaker by saying, play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.